This question is a rational inequality. Now I want to warn you, you might be tempted to multiply by all the denominators. And let me tell you why that would be a disaster. You can multiply by seven. That's totally fine. No problem doing that. But you're going to have a huge problem when you multiply by x minus two. So it looks like an innocent move to make, but is x minus two greater than zero? Or is x minus two less than zero? The problem is you don't know because x is a variable. It's very easy to make it positive. It's very easy to make it negative. What happens when it's negative? Your inequality sign flips. So you're going to have to keep track of if it's positive or negative, and you're going to get two different solutions with each of them will be a system of inequalities. You can solve it that way, but I'm not going to. It's not terribly fun. So instead, let's be more reasonable. I like this first move, multiply by seven. Uh, mainly I like it because it's one less fraction and I'm not the biggest fan of fractions. All right, so we're gonna solve for zero. And the easiest way I see to do that, we're gonna subtract x to the left. Easy to write down. So why does subtracting not flip the inequality? Adding, subtracting, neither of those flip the inequality. Only multiplication and division by negatives will flip your inequality. So what I just did, the subtraction or addition, is never gonna flip your inequality. So that's how you're gonna solve for x on an inequality. You're gonna move all the terms to one side using addition or subtraction. Now this is a little bit dangerous up here. I did use multiplication, but I multiplied by seven, which we know is positive. Okay, how in the world do you solve this? We're going to get common denominator and actually add this together. So but first, let's give this a name. F has not been used. This question just came in with only X's. So F of X equals seven X over X minus two minus X and we're gonna add using common denominator. All right, there's nothing in common, so that whole x minus two is gonna be our common denominator. So seven x over x minus two minus this x is only multiplied in the numerator, so we got x squared minus two x over x minus two. So now we have common denominator. So it's seven x minus x squared minus two x. You can distribute your negative sign if you want to and skip a step here. So I got negative x squared plus two x plus seven x is plus nine x over x minus two. All right, so how do we graph this? There's actually quite a few steps to graphing. This is graphing a rational function. This is all done back in uh, chapter or section 4.1. So you can go back and look there. There's a few pieces we need to graph this. Let's start with x-intercepts. How do we find those? Just remember x-intercepts are in the numerator and vertical asymptotes are in the denominator. So x-intercept, you're setting zero equal to negative x squared plus nine x. Lots of ways to solve this. Now let's go ahead and factor an x out. And right here we have zero product property. So either, so ZPP, zero product property, that means when you multiply and get zero, that means individually, x equals zero and or negative x plus nine equals zero. So x equals zero is already solved for x. Add x to both sides and we get nine equals x. All right, these are our x-intercepts. So we'll write the first one, zero, zero. The second one, nine, zero. The reason why factoring is a good idea, aside from factoring is awesome in pretty much every situation you can do it, is because you get to see the order of these x-intercepts. Now when I say the order, I'm gonna write this a little bit differently. 
I'm going to just put a parenthesis here. There's a first power and a first power. So they're both first powers, which means they both cross. So first power we call multiplicity one, which means cross. The second one is multiplicity one, meaning it's multiplied one time. Now remember crossing, what that means on our graph, it either looks like this or looks like that. Uh, if it was a bounce, it would either look like that or like that. We do not have a bounce x-intercept, so we're not worrying about that. So that takes care of x-intercepts. Let's go, uh, why do I not need a y-intercept? If you're paying attention, you already see the y-intercept on the screen right there when y is 0, x is 0. So that happens to also be a y-intercept. All right, we're going to do a vertical asymptote now and just set the denominator equal to zero. There's only one term there, two equals x, that's our vertical asymptote. This was a first power, you could put parentheses in a one, so this is gonna be another cross. What do those look like? That means on one side's gonna go up, the other side's gonna go down, or one side's gonna go down and the other side's gonna go up, as opposed to a bounce which means both sides go up or both sides go down. We, again, don't have a bounce here, so we don't need to worry about it. All right, last piece of information. We need the end behavior. All right, we're actually gonna get a slant asymptote here, but I don't need to be that precise. So we got minus x squared plus nine x divided by x minus two. Anytime we're dealing with end behavior, I don't care about the lower power terms. If I need to be more accurate on my slant asymptote, I would keep the nine x, so, well, let's just be more accurate. All right, factoring an x out. We can now cancel the x's, and we got negative x plus nine. All right, what does this look like? It's gonna be a slant asymptote, because our uh, numerator power was only one higher than the denominator power. Denominator power was a one, so the numerator one by one. So here we have a negative slope, so slope's negative one. Right there, that's our end behavior. Up on the left, down on the right. All right, so now we're finally ready to graph. So let's go ahead and do that. We have all the information we need on the screen. I'm gonna push it off of the screen, but hopefully you've written it down. So let's get a nice axis, axes. All right, we got zero, zero right there. Uh, now, if you actually follow the grid lines, I would need to go over quite a bit more, but let's say that that's nine, good enough. Uh, our vertical asymptote is, let's see, two. So if that's nine, we'll say two is somewhere right about here. So this is our x equals two. And we have our slant asymptote. Now I don't really care about the plus nine. It's not that important when you graph. So I'm just gonna follow the slope of the end behavior. Let's get our fancy ruler out. So I got a slope of negative one. Look how accurate everything is. Oh no. All right. Okay, so there's our end behavior. Okay, you can start wherever you want on here. I like to start at one of the ends and let's go grab a third color, we'll go green. Now this end behavior is in my way. Let me rewrite it somewhere convenient. All right, I have to approach this end behavior and that vertical asymptote and I have to hit that point. There's a lot of things I have to do at the same time. Let's start on the left. So our graph's gonna come down like this. Uh, actually, I circled the wrong part of that vertical asymptote. If I went up, the problem would occur that, or the problem that, that would be here is I would have a bounce intercept, which we do not have. 
So again, I'll start approaching the end behavior. Now I have to cross here. I have to cross the x-axis. And that means I have to head downwards. The only way to approach this is at the bottom. Now I have a cross vertical asymptote somewhere up here. This is the vertical asymptote behavior we're actually seeing. It's down on the left, which means it has to go up on the right. Okay, and have to hit the x-intercept. This one luckily is a cross. Now if it was a bounce, we'd have major problems because I could not approach the end behavior. But again, we do not have bounce x-intercept. We have a cross, so it crosses and keeps going down. All right, so are we done yet? No, we're not. We still have not answered our actual question. So there's a graph. Let's go look at our question somewhere, somewhere. Oh, wow, all that work. All right, so we need to rewrite the original question. I'll keep it in green here. So the question is, when is this we called f of x? So when is f of x greater than 0? So this means above the x-axis, or you could think of it as positive y values. All right, we're gonna just color in all the positive y values. I did not see equal zero, so we cannot choose zero y values, only positive. All right, our graph, there are two places for positive y values. We can get anywhere up here, but we can't use zero. And we can get, can't use nine, but anywhere up here we also use. All right, so we just have to describe these two intervals. The left one goes all the way to the left and stops at zero. The second piece starts at what x value? If we look a little more closely, it does not start at zero. There's all this negative part down here. So it actually starts at two and goes to, it's a little tricky to see that nine because I wrote on top, two to nine. All right, that is the answer to our question, our original inequality. I realize that's a lot of work, but not everything is easy. And you just basically need to do all those steps.